Hi, welcome. Thanks for joining us. You're watching a recording of First Christian Church Disciples of Christ in Nampa. Senior Pastor, Reverend Dr. Steve Parati. We believe a lot of things here, like the fact that all people are God's children. All, you heard me right. We have a special heart for those on the margins of society, those who've been shunned, left out, or put down. We seek to offer a sanctuary where your voice is cherished and your presence is beloved. We believe in genuine relationship building, truth telling, and transparency, warts and all. We've been waiting for you. Let's do this thing together. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Yeah. Yes, he has risen indeed. Uh, it's just, it is good to see you. It makes my heart happy. Um, we are here in our Lord's house, gathered here to try to figure out what this resurrection thing is all about, not just on Easter, but throughout our lives. What does it mean, this new life? How do we embrace this life in such a way that we can give expression to God's love in a way that really honors him, that doesn't you know, justify that we're right in this world or that we're better than others. It's just that we're trying to figure this out, and we've looked at the teachings of Jesus, and we don't want to complicate it. It just seems like a good way to live, right? And um, that, you know, we, we are willing to follow him and give him our very best. And my hope and my prayer is at this time of worship, you feel you are offering to God the best that you have. I know a lot of people come to church and say, feed me, give me, wow me, do whatever. This is about God. And this is our gift to him. So I just want you to kind of settle in and figure out where you need to be in offering your thoughts to God and just engaging with that presence and that spirit. And the fact of the matter is that spirit and that presence comes alive through our relationships, through those around you. So um, honor that. Respect one another's voice, opinion. Uh, we are God's children muddling through in this life uh, that we've been given and trying to figure out how can we best love God and neighbor. That's why we're here. Leading up to Easter, for those of you, a few of you who haven't been here, um, leading up to Easter, and um, what I've been doing is, you know, Holy Week, which is this past week, uh, referred to as Holy Week, I decided this year take um, time to walk through Holy Week. So what I did one Sunday, I just talked about the first day of this week, last Sunday, what was ha happening in our Lord's day when he entered into Jerusalem on that donkey and palms were waving. And then the following Sunday, I talked about uh, that last Monday and Tuesday of his life. And then the Sunday after that, I talked about the last Wednesday and Thursday of his life. And then this past Sunday, I talked about... Um, um, Wednesday, Thursday, I talked about this last Friday of his life and... This past Thursday, we talked about Saturday. And now we come to what? Easter, right? And here we are. And I've, I've really wanted to spend time with looking at what was going on in our Lord's life and the challenges he was having and the teachings he was offering. And it's all online. I mean, if you want to just kind of, you know, um, spend the rest of the day watching all those messages, you know, just. Get some popcorn and watch it. Um, but anyway, we've been walking through each day of our Lord's uh, last week of his earthly life. And we come to this reading in the Gospel of Mark. And it's chapter 16, verses 1 through 8 in the Bible, in the pew in front of you, if you want to follow along. It's on page 66 of the New Testament, the latter third of that Bible, page 66 if you want to follow with me. And it's verses, um, chapter 16, verses 1 through 8. Most scholars believe that the original ending of gospel ended with verse 8, okay? And that's where we're going to end. And um, this isn't one of those great, he is risen, hallelujah, pastel, colors fill the air kind of ending, okay? This is where Mark ended. And I'm going to be, I've been trying to be true to Mark. I'm going to be true to him now. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. 
And they had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? Hmm. And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, huh, sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed, but, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who is crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place that they had laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. And there you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Bam. Period. End of gospel. Whoa. Whoa. What do we do with that? Well, I'll do something with it. Um, allergies. Yeah, I have allergies. A colleague of mine in the ministry shared a story uh, of the first time she became pregnant. And she told everyone. She said, she said I, 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 I couldn't help myself. I had to tell everyone. I told my parents, told my church where I was a pastor, told my friends. And this was back in the mid-90s. So social media was quite a bit different back then, how you got the word out. And she said she told the convenience store clerk that she was pregnant. And it was the same convenience store clerk she would see every morning when she'd go in and get some coffee before she went into the church office. And she said the clerk genuinely was happy. And the next few weeks as she would go in to the convenience store, the clerk would ask her, how is she feeling? You know, is she you know, feeling any nausea at all? You know, any morning sickness? And she said, I'm, I'm doing okay, a little nausea, but you know, not bad. I'm going to see the doctor very soon. And then she said, I stopped going to the convenience store for a few months. When she got the gumption to be able to go back into the store, she um, pushed the glass door, and you know, there's familiar chimes that go on to let everyone know in the store a new customer has arrived. She said, there was the same clerk behind that counter. And he said, hey, how's it going? How are you feeling? And she said what she had to say in order to stop the questions. She simply said, I am no longer pregnant. Second time she got pregnant, she told just a handful of people thinking, there'll be fewer people to untell in case something happens again. And 15 weeks later, she had another miscarriage. Third time she said she got pregnant, she didn't tell anyone. Mm -mm, mm -mm. She barely let herself think about it. She measured her biological benchmarks, you know, took good care of herself, what she ate and what she drank, you know, took her uh, progesterone supplements that she needed to take. But there's one thing she did not allow herself to do for several months during that pregnancy, and that was hope. She didn't want to suffer the crush of disappointment again. She did everything possible to avoid those swing, those, those mood swings, you know. Uh, she wanted to mitigate any kind of disappointment and protect her heart. She resisted that maternal pull of anticipatory joy that a mother-to-be can have. She was afraid to tell people. She was afraid to hope. Her story got me thinking about hope. Okay? You know, during 2020, when we weren't meeting for several months here, I'd, I'd come into the sanctuary and I'd have it all to myself. And I noticed up in that spotlight up there that there was this big old cobweb up there. I left it there, left it there. And no one's coming to church. Ugh, just leave it there. 
Leaving it there in some ways, as I've thought back on it, kept me from getting my hopes up too high that people, everyone's going to return back to church eventually. Sort of like taking it down was like getting my hopes up too high. So I, I just left the, the cobweb hanging up there. Huh. And I thought, what if people decide being, after being away from church for so long that they don't really need church? Which, as it turns out, is quite true for a lot of people. But I did get a ladder, and I took that web down with a long stick. Yes, when I was taking it down, looking at that web, I felt the church was as lifeless as that cobweb. It's like, but I was, I was willing to be disappointed because, well, I had to hope. I have to hope to be able to breathe. And even though the church is not real important to many people in this world, it, 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 it is for me. I, I have this love-hate relationship with, with the church. I hate it. I hate what it's done to me and to my family, but I love it. I love what it's done for me and for my family. Uh, and I'd lay down my life for the church. Not for what it is, but what I hope and know it can be. I'll lay down my life for that. A place of refuge for all people. For all people. Across the board. So are we, a not, are we not at some level spiritual refugees? Each and every one of us. We are, we are ref we're longing for home. A place where we can feel accepted just as we are. No matter, no matter our social standing, our belief systems, our, 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 our politics, whether we're rich or poor, male or female, non-binary, whatever. We're all God's children. Okay? We just are. Hmm. I'd lay down my life for that kind of church. I hope for that kind of church where every voice is treasured, everyone is honored and respected because, dag nabbit, <laughs> too many people have been hurt by the church over the years. And I get it. I so get it. Sunday morning is often, it's still the most segregated time of the week in this nation. People fall back in their comfort enclaves of like-minded social respectability drape themselves with their Jesus attire, right? And that goes about as deep as the proverbial Easter bonnet. Mm. I get it. People go to church, especially stay today. You know, I, I, I get it. I, to um, keep family members happy or to go with a friend. It's an annual thing, a celebration, a tradition, which is beautiful. I, I, it's beautiful. But, but some of us, and I've been there, I've so been there, because I did not, church was not a big thing for me growing up. I drag, people drag their feet to church, even though it's Easter, still drag their feet to church. Fine, I'll go, whatever. Just make sure the pastor doesn't talk long. <laughs> and they'll drag as if, as if they're going more to a funeral than a celebration of life. I mean, I, I know for some of you it was just stressful getting here today. God bless you. You made it. Breathe. But it's like sometimes we're going to church more of obligation or duty than hope. Sort of like those women going to that tomb on Easter morning. As Mark tells the story here, the women who went to the tomb Sunday morning, they were on a mission. Seemingly all hope dispelled. Not going with a lot of hope. Walking through the motions to honor Jesus' lifeless body. The corpse of their beloved friend had been not put away properly. Okay, in that tomb. Due to the fact he died on Friday afternoon and the Sabbath began at sundown. And when the sun sets on Friday, 
no work. Someone's died, got to wait, okay? As far as the prayers, as far as the spices and oil and anointment of the body, got to wait. And that's what the women had to do. So sun set on Friday. When the sun set on Saturday and Sabbath ended, those women bought some spices, bought the ointments they needed to dress our Lord's body. But it was too late then with the sun setting, too dark to go into a tomb, that they waited till Sunday morning to take the spices and the ointments. Hmm. There they are heading to the tomb. Mary Magdalene, another Mary, and Salome. Salome, whose mother was wise enough not to give her the name of Mary. <laughs> and they arrive to the tomb. And it's open. Which is kind of weird. You know, a big old stone in front of that tomb. Just rolled away. It's kind of weird. Huh. And it's empty, which is weirder. Well, well not sort of empty, I guess you could say. There's someone inside, but it's not Jesus' body. Uh, uh, it's a young man dressed in a white robe. That's weirdest. And Mark says that the women were alarmed. Alarmed. Which is really the lowest level of fear in this story at the moment. Okay? They're not afraid or trembling in terror at this point. No, no. Things are just weird. And then there's this guy in his white robe. And he starts talking. And it's then the alarm begins to escalate for the women. And quickly, very quickly it does. Because he says, because of what he says, and he basically says this. He, he, he talks about that resurrection thing that Jesus spoke of while Jesus was alive. That Jesus would be arrested, tried, beaten, and nailed to a cross, and, and that he would die. Huh. But that he would also rise from the dead in three days. And that young man is saying, you know what Jesus was talking about? That happened. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Jesus is right now hiking to Galilee, up north. Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh this very moment. So you guys got to hurry and join him, all right? Because he's got a head start on you and you don't want Jesus hiking alone. So you get on up there towards Galilee. That's when the alarm turns into terror and amazement. It, 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 Mark says here, they went out and fled the tomb for terror and amazement seized them. Terror here in the Greek means trembling, literally trembling and literally shaking. They were quaking. It was a physical overload of adrenaline and cortisol just going through their body, okay? It's their body's response to the threat of potential harm. Okay, that's what terror means here. And amazement means not that, oh, wonder and awe. No, it means to be way outside of yourself with shock to be set aside, to, to be cast aside with distress. So those women are definitely afraid, all right? They were so lost in fear that at least for a little while, they said nothing to anyone. Because they were afraid. Ah. Now think about this, okay? It's not the empty tomb or the stranger hanging out inside. I mean, that weirdness is kind of alarming, okay? But when that young man says that they're looking for Jesus, their Jesus, the one whose breath bled out over agonizing hours on that previous Friday, the one whose physical presence they, they hoped would change everything for them forever, the one whose absence was a crushing defeat of, I don't know, of, of every new possibility for their lives and for the future of the world. That Jesus, that young man in the tomb said, that Jesus, yep, yep, yep. He's on his way right now to his home region in Galilee. You get on up there. Those women are leaving alarm in the dust as they race off and basically what I would say is a phasic Phobia. Phobia. Deep, deep fear. That is Mark's last word to his gospel. They were afraid. 
Now fathom this. The women were invited by the young man's words to imagine that everything they ever wanted in life, that every wish on every star they ever had was about to come true. I mean, do you dare to believe such things? That is, do you dare to hope? To embrace such hope could potentially be disastrous and heartbreaking. To let your, your hopes fly so high. Because recently, those women had high hopes. And it left them neck deep in grief. Watching Jesus cry out in agony on the cross. A cry of desolation and total and complete and utter abandonment, even feeling abandoned by God himself. So can these women afford to take the risk and hope again? Do they have the emotional energy? Huh. Here's one thing about hope. Deep down, hope requires the hoper, or the, the hopeful one, to invest their emotional, spiritual, and material well-being, their whole self, into something which they have no control over. Hope requires a giant leap of faith. Okay? Hope isn't having faith in one's ability to get things done or to figure things out. No, 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 no. Or to earn the universe's rewards because the universe is, is morally neutral, okay? Things will just happen. If it's really hope that we're talking about, there's nothing you can do to make it happen. How do you like that? A hope that this pregnancy will take. Hope that, you know, that refugee someday will be able to return to their homeland. Hope that your family of origin will love you for who you are and not for who they say you need to be. Hope that the doctors will figure it, figure it out and get you the right course of treatment. Hope that the church, right? Hope that the church won't let you down. Hope that there's a light at the end of the tunnel where sin has trapped you because of something you've done or something that's been done to you. Hope that those people, whoever those people are out in this world, do not have the final say or last word of who you are because no one should have the final say or word about who you are. That's left to God. Hope that that young man in that tomb speaks the truth. That the living, breathing Savior of this world is right now planting his footsteps on the earth's surface. Because like always, he has things to do, people to see, and places to go. And death cannot keep its prey. Hmm. Kind of hope I'm talking about. The terrifying kind that provokes you sprinting and leaves you speechless. That kind of hope is, um, well, it's just downright dangerous. It is. It's propped up on that rickety platform that we call faith. Uh-huh. Huh. A hope that's bending towards the one who will ultimately wipe away every tear and take away your distress and swallow up death forever. Oh, to hope for that. If that level of longing makes you just a tad afraid, because you're acquainted with being disappointed. Join the Mary and Mary and Salome Club, okay? Those terrified women, I mean, eventually they told people about what they saw. I mean, we're here, aren't we? But Mark is kind and gentle to let us know that they needed a moment to kind of collect themselves. And maybe we just need to be graceful with ourselves as well. And it got me thinking, what if... This is one of the key central reasons for why the church exists. To help each other hope. To help each other get free of 
fear's icy grip. And that God ultimately uh, will get what God wants. What if we're to be like gymnasts? And we're to spot each other for those death-defying leaps of faith. We're to be each other's safety net, if you will. Right? Making sure that no one falls uh, too hard or too far. Making sure that everyone feels safe so they can try it again and again and again. I mean, I know we, we've had peop- we have people here who are gymnasts or who are in cheer, right? And, you know, if you're, you're the flyer, you hope that catcher is doing the right thing. And if you're the catcher, you hope that flyer is doing the right thing. But you can't do it. You, you, you need each other. At some level, it's out of your hands. You just got to hope. That kind of hope to unfold, we've got to believe, okay? Follow me here. We've got to believe that this kind of gathering is important, that it is important, that we need each other to encourage each other, to assist one another, to find the courage to hope and believe that what is good and what is kind in this world will ultimately prevail because, man, it's it's easy to go down that dark place. And for such hope, I think God has designed us in a way that we need one another. We need human companionship where we share our struggles and our stories. I get it, finding God in the mountains and on the Sunday morning and just by yourself with God. And I get it. You need more. Jesus didn't stay on the mountaintop. He came down. He needed people. Okay? So let me share with you a story here. Then I'll, I'll begin to wind it up after that. Let me share with you a story here of a church that embraces such hope. And this is the church uh, that Wayne Cordiero um, uh, experienced when he was in China. Uh, Ray Wayne Cordero, he's a um, minister at New Hope Fellowship in Honolulu, Honolulu, Hawaii. Anyway, this is the story he shared when he was in China. He said, people from the Hunan province which is in south-central China, they rode a train for 13 hours to attend a seminar that Wayne was, was leading. It was a seminar for church leaders. And it was a couple dozen people from that province who took that train. And they, they traveled those 13 hours, and they get to where they needed to arrive at, and they got a hotel room. But they got one hotel room, 700 square feet. And uh, they said they entered the hotel room kind of two by two to not draw attention to them, to how many people were going to be in that little hotel room. That is 24 people squeezing in there because that's all they could afford. And for three days, they undertook training, those 24 people did. They undertook training from eight to five. And the only breaks were to eat and to use the restroom on the fly. All the training occurred in that little room. And Wayne, the American missionary, asked the 24 people, what would happen if if he's caught doing what he's doing, training them there in China? They said he would get deported in 24 hours and they would go to prison for three years. And so he asked them, well, how many of you have been in prison for your faith? And of the 24, 19 raised their hand. He asked the 24, um, well, how many people, I know you're leaders there in the Hunan province, how many people do you all really oversee? And they began to count among themselves, and they figured it was a little over 20 million people in their jurisdiction. I think I have a headache. And all their gatherings were illegal, and undercover. The minister, Wayne, um, at one point during the seminar, passed out some Bibles. He only had um, 15 Bibles, so he was nine short. And he said, let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 
And one lady had a Bible, and she handed her Bible over to another person who was there next to her. And as some of the people began to read the scripture, the minister understood why she gave it away. She'd memorized that chapter. And she just recited it as people were reading. During a break, the minister asked her, you memorized that chapter? She said, oh, I've, I've memorized many chapters. Well, where'd you memorize it? In prison, you have a lot of time on your hands. Well, didn't they confiscate the Bible in prison? Uh, yeah, yeah. So people bring scripture written on little pieces of paper. Well, if they find the paper, don't they confiscate that? Yes. That's why you have to memorize it as quickly as possible. They can take the paper away, but they can't take away what's in your heart. After three days of eight to five in that tiny little hotel room, the leader asked as he was getting ready to leave, how may I pray for all of you? And he said, we love getting together like this. Like you do in America. We wish we could do it more. So please pray that we can be just like you. And the minister said, I won't, I won't do that. And everyone got these big, incredulous eyes looking at him. Like, what do you mean? It's like, he said, you guys, <laughs> you rode a train for 13 hours to get here. In my country, if you have to drive more than a half hour somewhere, um, people don't come. You sat on a wooden floor for three days. In my country, if you have to sit longer than an hour, people leave. I know that. You sat here on a hard wooden floor without any air conditioning. In my country, if people don't have padded pews or chairs and air conditioning, people often don't come back. In my country, we have an average of two Bibles per family, and they don't read any of them. You have hardly any Bibles, and you memorize Scripture from little pieces of paper. I won't pray that you become like us, but I will pray that we become a little more like you. What if that young man in that not-so-empty tomb said, don't be alarmed, but do get excited. Have hope. I dare you. I don't know. I double, I triple-dog dare you, okay? Because as far as I can tell, despite everything the world threw at Jesus, Jesus could hardly wait to get back here to love us. After everything we did to him, he couldn't wait, get, couldn't wait to get back to love us. To love us with a longing that maybe this time, maybe this time, we as his followers will finally get it and receive that hope that he offers us and that hope we receive when we get together. At first, yeah, the women were scared speechless. Too scared to hope it was true. But they found their voices and shouted it out from the rooftops, Christ is risen. So what if by telling their stories, dear friends, those women are now daring us, double and triple dog daring us, to take what that young man in that tomb gave to those women, a most dangerous gift, the gift of hope. If Jesus is risen, if he's really, if he's really out there, then that is the dare. Take it, church. Take it. Take what that young man was giving to those women. Mm. Hope. Hope in the face of so much darkness in this world. It's a hope that, that can appear so feeble and so foolish to those in power. 
but it's a hope that will nonetheless burn with passion. It's a hope that prevails. It's a hope in the power of God. It really is. It's a hope in kindness and humility and a gentle courage that dares to lay down its life for another human being. A hope that prevails when God's children value the beauty of human companionship, of coming together and seeing that coming together as a gift to God. My hope, my hope is that someday we will get it. We will understand that as a church. And that our being here, dear friends, is bigger than any of us. And that we will do our damnedest to be sure that no one here, no one here will ever be devoid of human companionship. I do believe that it's in such love for each other that seeds of hope are planted that give rise to a faith that proclaims to the world Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us pray. Heavenly God, as we gather together here within your house, we just ask for your Son to rise within us in a manner that we can give expression to your love for us and if we can share that love with each other. Each of us will do it in our own unique way. But we need each other, dear God. Help us to understand that. The beauty of community that gathers in your son's name truly gives life to what Easter is all about. It offers hope to people who are lonely and afraid out there. It offers a voice for those who can't find a word to say. It offers support to catch those who are flying and daring to risk hope in this world, to be a hopeful person, that we will catch each other because there'll be times we will fall. But we know with each other, with you within us, dear God, we will rise together to your glory. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Thanks for watching. We think what we've learned about God is the best news in the world. That God's love is real, God's love is for you, and God's love is worth it. Our doors stay open because of the generous giving of people like you. If you would like to financially support the ministry of First Christian Church, you can give in person on our website at nampafirstchristian.org or via text by typing in the amount you would like to give and sending that to 208-314-3322. May God's love be real to you today. We'll catch you next time.